Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so indeed, we're going to switch gears and, and switch genders onto, onto men. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I just want to highlight, and I think similar to the other authors, that, I mean, you know, the other co-authors on here uh, really played, a, you know, an instrumental role in, in a variety of different ways. And so I'm presenting on behalf of uh, Mackie Friedman, Scott Geibel, Kevin Reby, uh, Borchi Bochinov, uh, Dauda Juf, uh, Keith Sabin, Claire Holland, uh, Roy Chan, and Carlos Caceres. So as an overview, I'll just talk a little bit about sort of why we engaged in this review, some of the methods that we used, to try and distinguish a little bit between male sex workers and, and men who sell sex, and then uh, give some overview about what we have in terms of data regarding the epidemiology of HIV among male sex workers, focusing both on, on the actual burden of HIV, but also what we know about acquisition and transmission risk factors, and some of the limitations in the existing HIV surveillance systems, and some thoughts on how to advance HIV prevention, treatment, and care uh, for these men. So, you know, just as a broad frame, what we wanted to do is apply an HIV framework to understand uh, the ethnographic and HIV epidemiologic data that was available focused on male sex workers. And we did this in order to really provide justification for dedicated advocacy, uh, meaningful funding levels, uh, definitional, definitional consistency in terms of HIV surveillance, uh, and also meaningful research initiatives for male sex workers. And so, uh, similar to the other authors, we used a series of systematic reviews, uh, looking at the peer-reviewed and non-peer-reviewed literature, going back about 15 years, uh, focusing on the HIV epi, uh, with the recognition that where we could, we focused on studies of male sex workers. In other uh, cases, as I'll talk about, we looked at male sex workers as sub-samples uh, uh, within broader studies among men who sex with men and female sex workers. And then we looked at the prevention science literature as well to try and uh, synthesize data on, on uh, meaningful prevention approaches. Where, uh, as in many settings, there really is very limited data in the peer-reviewed literature around um, male sex work, and so we also had each of the authors uh, do regional consultations in their own areas, and so Carlos Caceres for the LAC region, uh, Borche for the Eastern Europe, former Soviet Union, uh, for Sub-Saharan Africa, we had separate uh, consultations for West and Central, Eastern and Southern Africa, and then uh, finally Roy Chan uh, for South and Southeast Asia. And then we worked with Keith Sabin uh, to look at the UN General uh, Assembly special session on HIV for data from 2002 to 2012, and more recently the Global AIDS Response Progress uh, reports uh, data from 2014. So I think the first thing that sort of comes to mind in terms of really understanding uh, male sex workers is really how complex the identity is. And so, you know, a, really a small proportion of the men who actually sell sex identify as male sex workers. In many of the studies, it was under 10% of the men self-identified, which really highlights the complexity of addressing these men or even sort of adapting programs focused on gay men or other men who have sex with men for these men. And similarly, the sexual orientation really uh, ranges from, from all the way from gay to straight. And, and so again, sort of understanding how to address these men is gonna have to transcend just approaches for MSM. Male sex workers in general are less visible in a variety of different ways than female sex workers, and part of that is just because they're a smaller population than our female sex workers. But also, in the context of already a stigmatized occupation, as in sex work, male sex work is especially stigmatized within that frame. And then, even sort of broadly, you know, we as a scientific community and the general sort of public domain have, have done far less research to try and understand the specific needs of sex workers. And then I think even more recently in the last five or 10 years, what we're seeing is that with the evolving modalities of sex work, really transitioning from being an exclusively street or venue-based approach to being nearly, uh, in, in many settings, in, in many high-income settings and emerging in, in low middle-income settings as well, you know, men have really moved off the streets into the online sphere, uh, into mobile apps and, and the web. And so again, our traditional approaches in terms of sampling, in terms of prevention, are, are further challenged in that dynamic. In terms of where we had data available from the systematic review, we had 81 studies across 19 countries. Working together with UNAIDS, uh, just looking at the last four years when they had uh, data reported specifically for male sex work, uh, they had data from 27 countries. So in total, we had data uh, going back about 15 years from 44 out of 192 countries with any prevalence data. And what we've done is, is map that out here, and, and I think you know, what we can see is there's actually a broad um, distribution of the burden of HIV among sex workers. In some places, it's higher than it is among other MSM, and in some settings, it's lower. I think what we realize is that in most of the places where MSM studies have been done, we haven't delineated specific risks among male sex work, and potentially actually in those samples have oversampled male sex workers as compared to other MSM, just really highlighting the importance of understanding the specific burden and the specific risks.
What we can also see with this map is just the large parts of the world that really remain unmapped in terms of any studies among male sex workers uh, throughout the history of the pandemic. Another thing that comes to mind when we looked at these data and really dug down is that, you know, in terms of the three sort of universal key populations, female sex workers, men who sex with men, and people who inject drugs, what we recognize is that male sex workers often end up as much smaller samples in terms of larger samples among female sex workers or men who sex with men. And even when you look at the samples and when you can actually look at the studies, you find that often when you're looking at studies of male sex workers, in fact, uh, it's transgender sex workers. And so just sort of further you know, complicating the interpretation of these data about who's actually at risk and, and what puts them at risk. The sample sizes and data quality really vary greatly. I, um, I say that as, an, a, as a, a soft way of saying it. Um, you know, in terms of UNGAS and GARPER data, in, in many of the settings in which we looked at, um, for nationwide surveys, we're talking about less than 10 people. Uh, and so while we didn't include that on the map, it just highlights uh, how little data has really been collected among male sex work and how little attention has been given. And part of that is also because male sex work hasn't been delineated as a specific surveillance uh, population, uh, both in many settings, including the United States. Uh, there's really no behavioral category for male sex work, and I think also you know, may explain why there's been such limited investment, limited funding, and limited study. Moving on to thinking about the vulnerabilities, when we looked at this, you see very clear individual level risk factors, sexual network res uh, related risk factors, and, and structural related risk factors. And some of this we've already heard, but some of this is specific to male sex work. When we look at individual level risk factors in terms of behavioral risks, you know, obviously we're talking about higher numbers of sexual partners than other MSM. But what we also see in the studies are significant variability in the access to as well as the use of condom compatible lubricants as well as appropriate condoms. So not just any condoms, but appropriate condoms for male sex work. In terms of biological risks, you know, similar to other men who have sex with men, you know, we see that there's a high efficiency of, of HIV transmission during unprotected anal intercourse with serodiscordant viremic partners. And also, in many of the studies where STIs were included, you see high levels of untreated STIs, both anally and penile STIs. But in terms of network level risks, these come out very clearly among male sex work. You see large sexual networks that include people who are living with HIV, as well as people where studies have been done are acutely infected with HIV. Similarly, you also include uh, people who inject drugs. But also you see very non-dense sexual networks, so people are, have limited awareness of, of the HIV status among other people within that sexual network. In terms of, of, of stigma and criminalization, you know, again, similar to what we've already heard today, you see multiple layers. So you know, we've heard about MSM in many settings being hyper-criminalized. Um, you know, similarly with that with male sex work. So you have the criminalization of sex work. In many settings, you have the criminalization of same-sex practices. You have the criminalization of, of HIV non-disclosure in, in many countries of the world, including my own of Canada. Uh, and uh, we also have the criminalization of substance use, which we also know to be a syndemic along uh, in many of these settings with HIV. When we look at the layers of stigma, it's even more complex. You have stigma related to sexual orientation, HIV-related stigma, both perceived and enacted, internalized stigma really as a consequence of these extreme stigmas that we see externally, substance use-related stigma, stigma related to socioeconomic status, and finally, stigma related to same-sex practices. And all these really come together and are confluent among male sex workers. Looking at prevention studies, I think what was, was fascinating is that going back over 20 years, we found 17 studies focused exclusively on male sex work, and nine of those were formative studies. But you see some clear thematics coming out of those formative studies. You see the importance of really engaging, you know, and understanding your local context and engaging stakeholders within the sex work community. You understand the importance of harm reduction interventions, of HIV STI testing, and then ultimately treatment of those STIs. You see the importance of providing multiple services as part of your programs in terms of drawing people in, looking at jobs, housing, legal, and, and substance use programs. And finally, just again, the importance of community level interventions, thinking about stigma reduction, but that's specific to sex workers uh, as compared to other MSM. Only eight outcome-related studies have been done among male sex workers, but where uh, they've been shown to be effective have included, again, drop-in centers with multiple services, strengths-based approaches, and finally, trying to use brief and uh, episodic interventions uh, 
using things like the respect model as well as harm reduction services. I think four key themes come out uh, as part of this, this short talk, uh, you know, when we think about how to advance HIV prevention, treatment, and care among male sex workers. And one of those that comes out is just really trying to engage male sex workers where they're at and where they're working. And, and that's really going to vary greatly by region and by setting, and that means really trying to understand the local dynamics of male sex work within your own community, whether it be on the streets or whether it be exclusively on the web. Integrating behavioral, biomedical, and structural approaches and recognizing that, especially among male sex workers, with this extremely high force of, of HIV transmission, we have to consider treatment-based approaches. So that means universal, universal access to treatment in terms of addressing their own needs as well as minimizing onward transmission. That means also thinking about things like PrEP, PEP, and, and, and similar to as what Linda Gale said, thinking about rectal microbicides as they become available. Um, you know, another thing that comes out clearly is just the, you know, the importance of engaging country-led, regional, global networks of sex workers, again, to really think about how to operationalize and how to implement the very interventions that we know to be effective. And finally, I think Michael Kirby said this, you know, extremely well on, on the opening night, but really addressing the policy failures that we know that potentiate risks among these men and undermine any meaningful prevention, treatment, and care programs. So I'll just finish by saying, you know, by really, I think, stating the obvious that male sex workers are extremely diverse, they're complex, and they're a unique key population for HIV prevention, treatment, and care. And we really need better prevention and surveillance data to understand and develop rights-affirming, evidence-based services for these men to protect them, but also to protect everybody within their sexual networks. So, thank you. <laughs>